What is up, Ascenders? This is episode 8 of Awaken with Timber Hawkeye. Here's what's coming up. If you wake up every morning and you're thinking, I'm not rich enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not successful enough or whatnot, then you're starting every day from a place of lack and deficiency. Take a step back and kind of observe this internal dialogue and say, I have a choice. I can choose to be grateful for what's there. It's not about looking at the glass as half full as opposed to half empty. It's about being grateful to have a glass in the first place. Welcome back to another episode of Awaken, brought to you by Ascend. I'm Brian Henry, the founder of Ascend and your host. On Awaken, it's our mission to propel humanity in the direction of universal growth. And we do this by having special guests onto the show, who will share with us their experiences and wisdom to help us attain a greater state of health, live on a higher plane of consciousness, and manifest abundance in our lives. Ascenders, if you have not yet already joined our Facebook community, we would love for you to do so. A lot of great stuff happening there, a lot of positivity being spread, and a lot of wisdom being shared. So again, we'd love to have you join us. And if you're interested, you can do so at www.togetherweascend.com forward slash community. Hope to see you guys there. So in this episode, I'm speaking to Timber Hawkeye, the best-selling author of Buddhist Bootcamp and Faithfully Religionless. And Timber has a very interesting story. He once lived a life similar and relatable to most, where he was working a office job, making the money that he did so that he can buy the things that he wanted, things that he thought would make him happy. But Timber reached a point in his journey where he realized that the life that he was living was never going to make him happy. Timber says he was working full-time and living part-time, but he wanted to turn this around. He wanted to find a way to simplify his life so that he can spend more time doing the things that he enjoyed. And this is exactly what he did. He moved to Hawaii and was able to find that life where he was spending more time living and less time working. Timber took this process of simplifying his life even further when he began to study Buddhism. And he went on to take the monastery vows and live as a Buddhist monk. And through these experiences, Timber learned so much that he eventually made the decision that he was going to take what he learned and share it with others. And that has led him to where he is today, spreading a message through Buddhist Boot Camp, which is all about helping people train their mind. And at the core of Timber's message is a very simple one. And it's that you should be grateful. Because being grateful has a way of taking what you have and making it enough. And that's the true definition of being rich. And that has resonated so much with me. So what I've done for you guys is I've put together a guide on how to start a gratitude practice because I'm confident that after listening to this episode, you will see great importance in doing so. So if you'd like to pick up that guide, you can do so at www.togetherweascend.com forward slash gratitude practice. I hope you guys check it out. But without further ado, let's jump into the interview, learn more about how Buddhist boot camp helps someone train their mind and how through simplifying our life, we can find out and realize that we already have everything that we need. This is Timber Hawkeye. Timber Hawkeye is the best-selling author of Buddhist Boot Camp and Faithfully Religionless. He shares his non-sectarian approach to being at peace with the world with the intention to awaken, enlighten, enrich, and inspire. Through his experiences, he has discovered the beauty of letting go and being grateful, and in sharing these experiences, he has established a massive following of people that his ideas have resonated with. The Buddhist Boot Camp Facebook page alone has 470,000 followers. Timber, I think it's safe to say that your outlooks have helped many people uh, change their lives for the better, and I'm very excited to have you on the show to share those outlooks with our listeners. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having this great show and uh, sharing the message. I appreciate it. Great. So before we get into things, I want to uh, into your your teaching and what Buddhist Boot Camp is all about. I want to hear a little bit more about your story. So I know that you made a very interesting decision some time ago to pick up things and and move to Hawaii with very little financial security. What did your life look like before you made that decision? 
It looked very, I would say, typical in the sense that I was working in the corporate world. I was making a lot of money. I had the condo downtown, the designer clothes, the designer furniture. I was very concerned with appearances. I was on the rat wheel, you know, and uh, chasing, trying to fill some void to, for approval, for happiness. And it was exhausting. I was working all the time and, and just finding that it wasn't it, trying to impress other people, uh, wasn't, wasn't working. Uh, there's a line in fight club about working jobs we hate so we can buy stuff we don't need to impress people we don't like. And that really hit hard. So I decided to sell everything and go to Hawaii with the simple intention to live a simple and uncomplicated life. So was it there a, a debate in your head going around about this or was it kind of a move that you, you knew had to happen? One day, one of the other paralegals at the law firm while I was working was celebrating her 30 year anniversary at the firm. And the fact that she was celebrating 30 years in a cubicle, that scared me. That was my wake up call because I got to see, to, you know, my future and said, this is going to be my life if I don't make this change now. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't so much of a debate. I knew I, I didn't know what kind of life I wanted, but I knew right there and then what life I didn't want. And I think that's an equally helpful navigation tool as we go through life is the, the process of elimination. And when you rule out what you don't want, the path almost appears before you. The key is to, to proceed with curiosity, not necessarily caution. Mm -hmm. And, and that, and be excited about the unknown rather than scared of it. And even if, if, if there were moments of fear, it's, it's to do it anyway. So to acknowledge like, hey, this is scary, but I'm going to do it anyway. And so there was no debate. There was just this awareness that I am going off the main road, so to speak. Like <laughs> I'm taking a side path here. And there aren't going to be as many cars around me. There aren't going to be, it's not going to be well marked. <laughs> There's not going to be, so, but I'm trusting because I know where the road I was on was leading. Yeah. So, you know, not knowing where I was going was almost more exciting than knowing for sure where I was going to end up. So, and it's been incredible ever since. So no, no debate. That's amazing. It just, it sounds like it just felt right for you. Like you, you thought about it and everything inside you said, this is, this is the direction I have to go in. Yeah. It's, and, and it's, like I said, I didn't have, um, any money saved up. I literally, I had just made the last payment towards that credit card, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every month we pay off that credit card or we send a payment towards that credit card to finally pay it off. And after I remember in my 20s, I had 36, no, it was 23 uh, credit cards to my name. It was ridiculous. And and uh, I remember the day when I wrote the last check to the last credit card and thinking to myself, man, next month I don't have to send Citibank this money. Uh, what am I going to do with that extra money? And that's when the light bulb went off is that I don't have to make that extra money. I can mm -hmm. just work less and live more. And that became my mantra. And it's so it's not about, you know, I'm never telling everyone that need to sell everything and move to Hawaii. That was I think we all have our Hawaii, our own version of what that looks like. And it's not an all or nothing. It's it's working part time so you can live full time and finding a balance that works for you. And again, and if you love doing what you do and you love doing it 80 hours a week, mm -hmm. Godspeed. It's it's when I first went to Hawaii on vacation and I saw how people on the island were living. And, and yeah, they all had jobs. But when they got off work, um, we would play volleyball until late hours of the night cause, or tennis because the lights of the tennis courts never turned off. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, 11 o'clock at night and still 76 degrees and. It was it was fantastic. And I thought, man, and people, my friends told me, oh, you know, Timber, you were just there on vacation. You're I said, no, no, these are people who live there. This is how they live their lives. So the idea of even if you get off work, you're still next to the ocean that that was a big turn on. And I thought it's not 
about escaping. It's about incorporating more nature into my daily life. That's awesome. That it sounds like such a beautiful lifestyle. So I want to hear a little bit more about uh, what your experience was like living in Hawaii. Um, I know that you you spent some time living in a monastery. What uh, what were your experiences there? How did, how did you go about living your life? Well, it was. I had no job lined up. I had no place to live lined up. I didn't know what I was going to do. Like I said, I just got there and kept my options open. And there was a job opening at first, um, managing an online art gallery for three hours a day. And I said, well, that sounds great. Uh, <laughs> I could just play volleyball in the morning. I can play volleyball in the afternoon. It was fantastic. And I was in the ocean and I was playing tennis and I was playing volleyball and it was really great. And one day I thought, you know, what What would happen if I stopped playing volleyball, which was a very big reason for my move to Hawaii. And I remember my dad was there visiting and we took my dad to the beach and we were playing volleyball together because I grew up watching him play. And I told him, I said, I think I think I'm going to I'm going to drop this. And he said, well, why? What's the harm in playing volleyball? I said, well, there's not necessarily harm in it, but I'm curious what would fill its time if I don't. And I don't know what will, but and I know that it won't present itself until I do, if that, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, and and again, I, when I say I was playing volleyball, I was I was playing seven hours a day. It was it was a bit extreme. Wow. So I decided to to let that go, and and I, that's when I really got to look deeper into Buddhism and uh, religion and psychology and studying not just what people believe, but why we believe what we do and. In true timber fashion, it's not. It wasn't just a matter of reading a couple of books. It was finding a Tibetan Lama and sitting down and studying with him and learning and and taking the monastic vows and giving up not just volleyball but everything else. And and as simple as my life already was, the monastic life seemed even more simple uh, because you know you just have your robes. It was it was just so serene, but. The Tibetan Buddhism was a bit more complicated than my intention. I mean, that's that was kind of the catch-22 is that I thought of Buddhism as very simple and uncomplicated. And yet Tibetan Buddhism is quite complex with its artistic depictions of the Dharma. And I, I, I include this in the introduction to my book is I remember sitting in front of the Tibetan Lama and telling him, you know, I don't think the Buddha intended for his teachings to get this complicated. And he just laughed and he said, the Buddha didn't do this. This is Tibetan culture, you know, try Zen. And there are, gosh, over 800 different schools of Buddhism. So some are more or, or less complicated than others. So I tried Zen and that, that was fantastic. And again, in true timber fashion, I just moved into a Zen monastery. I didn't just open a book. Um, and I just kind of jumped around different monasteries and temples and uh, it, it really gave me an opportunity to go within, which is where the answers truly are. Uh, I think when we read an inspirational book or hear a great TED talk or whatnot and, and our eyes light up and we get excited, it's not because we're necessarily hearing something for the first time. It's because something is speaking and echoing the truth that we already know deep mm -hmm. within. Mm -hmm. And those were the light bulbs that were going off in my head. And I was thinking, yes, yes, this is it. So it's been an incredible journey to then feel the that I, I, I'm answering your question in, in, in extreme length. But <laughs> I love it. No, I love it. Keep, keep going. My OK. Man. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I received a letter um, at the monastery from a friend because what happened when I moved into the Zen monastery, it was off the grid. So when I first moved to Hawaii, I was sending letters to my friends every month to let them know what's going on with me to kind of keep them updated because they were freaked out about what was happening with my life. Mm -hmm. But when I moved into the monastery, those letters stopped because I was off the grid. No email, no Internet, no, no phone, nothing. So I received a handwritten letter from a friend pointing out to me that what I was doing was very selfish. And, and in the sense that she's, you know, she's like, I know you believe that we are on this planet to learn to be selfless. And it's interesting that you tucking yourself away in the mountain somewhere with no connection to the outside world is pretty so I mean, it's 
you're how are you being of service if, mm. if you took a vow to be of service how are you being of service and there was truth to what she said I don't regret going but hearing that I couldn't justify staying mm. so I I'd, I had learned at this point about the middle path and I decided uh, to leave that monastery and 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 I didn't want to go back to the corporate world uh, but I didn't want to stay in the mountains, so I moved into a temple with Wi-Fi. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was my middle the ground, middle path, yeah. <laughs> and that's when I decided um, to take her up on her invitation to those those letters that I was sending to her and to all my other friends over the course of eight years since my move to Hawaii. Uh, she said, "You know, why don't you share those letters with the world, like do a blog or Facebook page?" And mind you, I had I had no social media, nothing. I was. And I took her up on it uh, because the message you mentioned in the beginning, my teachings, my my message, it's not my teachings and it's not my message. This is ancient stuff. Mm -hmm. I just share in a way my translation of it uh, with the world and it really resonates. And and I think it's because my invitation is to go a step beyond thinking that something is a good idea to actually implementing it into our daily lives. Right. And when you see someone who's actually done it, you're like, well, he did it. <laughs> I can do it. And so it's really I, I almost dislike the word inspirational. Um, I prefer motivational because then you're motivated to do something. There's actual forward momentum within it. Right, and that's right. that's what I aspire for. Yeah, no, I love your approach, Timber. And I think one of the things that stands out uh, about it with me is that that idea that you're not you're not saying this is what you need to be doing or this is the right way it's more of a here's the experiences that i've had here mm -hmm. is what i've come to learn about my own life and in just sharing that people people have connected with those ideas and i think one of the things that you you mentioned in the book is um the the idea that is opposite to to what you you believe is also true Yes, yes. And yeah, it, there's not a single should statement in either book. Uh, like you said, I'm not telling anyone what they should do. And if you study nonviolent communication, you know, the word should is one of the most hostile words in our language. Um, and yes, the first principle in Buddhist boot camp is that the opposite of what you know, is also true to somebody else somewhere else because of their time, place and circumstance. And the, the reason I made it such a, a like the first principles, because if you can wrap your mind around that, if you can accept that someone else's truth is just as valid as your own, that they believe it is just as real to them as your truth is to you, then judgment drops away. Acceptance opens up, compassion, understanding, and you're more inclined to engage in conversation with someone who believes the exact opposite from you, mm -hmm. not in order to prove yourself superior by making them inferior or to feel right by making someone else wrong, but to better understand and go, huh, well, that's interesting. Not necessarily agree to it, not necessarily subscribe to it, but having a wider perspective that to them, that's true, while to you, this is true, and you can still coexist w without, you know, having to uh, prove yourself somehow right. In Autobiography of a Yogi, it's called um, feeling tall by cutting off the heads of other men. Mm -hmm. But there's no need to do that. Yeah, and I, I think it makes way for for more harmonious living. Absolutely, which brings, and that's what's so interesting, you know, there's a lot of misconception that when Buddhism focuses so much on looking within and going within and self-help and self-care, it, it again sounds very selfish, but if the intention behind maintaining inner peace and having personal peace is so then you can live at peace with others, then even your your search for self-discovery or whatnot is for the greater good. Uh, that the Buddha was asked, you know, how can you be taking a nap when so many people need your help? And he said, well, I can't help anyone if I don't get my nap. You know, so even his nap was a selfless act. Um, in very much the same way and on airlines, they tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself before putting it on children. Because if you're not getting any air, you can't help anyone else. So self-care is not selfish. It's actually a, the greatest way we can be of service to others is by improving ourselves. Yeah. Right. If, if the self-care is in the interest of bettering yourself so that you, you can better serve, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. So that kind of leads into uh, to talking about Buddhist boot camp a little bit more and kind of the questions I have around that. So one of the things that I know that you say is that it's not about being a Buddhist. It's about being a Buddha. And mm-hmm. it's not about being coming enlightened. It's about um, acting through through enlightenment or doing doing enlightenment. Yeah. What, what do those it, things mean? Uh, well, it was Suzuki Roshi who said there are no enlightened beings. There's only enlightened activity. And that was the most liberating, I think, sentence I've ever read because what he's essentially saying, the, the enlightened beings we imagine, uh, whether it be the Dalai Lama or Gandhi or Buddha or Jesus, uh, they were people who were just like you and I. They just made enlightened activity part of their daily lives. And I just remember thinking, well, shoot, I can do that, (laughs) you know? So it was this very empowering invitation because quite often we find ourselves thinking, well, that's great for them, you know, those people, and I'm sure they can do that. They're saints or whatnot, but not me. And it was, and bringing um, them to eye level and seeing them and hearing, you know, what Jesus said to himself, that we're all brothers and sisters, that we're all one, that we can move mountains, that we can do. So the invitation is not to be Christian, it's to be Christ-like. It's not to be mm-hmm. Buddhist, it's to be Buddha-like. It's to um, just be, uh, for lack of, of a better quote, because you can't improve on such a great quote by Gandhi, is to be the change you wish to see in the world. Right, you know, right. like, and and I often say, you know, it, I don't care what you believe because your beliefs don't make you a better person. Your behavior does. What you do. yeah. So yeah, so the books are really about behavior modification and how to live in line with your own values. It doesn't t- give you values and say live like this. It tells you take a time out, think about. What are my core values and am I living in line with them? Mm -hmm. Because true happiness, harmony, as you said earlier, is when what we think, what we say and what we do are all in alignment. alignment. So and that's I mean, that's blissful living every day because you're eliminating the internal conflict, the internal struggle of beating yourself up. Because even when we were kids, there was we've been introduced to the concept of an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. Mm -hmm. And there's this constant uh, tug of war. And but when you're living in congruence, there's no war. You're just at peace and then you can live at peace with others. And someone can tell you they believe the exact opposite from you. And you can just say, that's interesting and move on with your day. (laughs) That's awesome. So I know that Bruce Boot Camp is is about training the mind. And I think a lot of what we've already mentioned is is already touching on in the ways that that you want to, to train or help someone train the mind to think. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to dive a little bit deeper into to what that process looks like, what that training looks like. And I mean, I guess we can even start with why do we need our to, to train our minds in the first place? What What is it that that we're training the, it for um, on top of, of course, all the things that we mentioned to, to be able to live in harmony and live yeah. in peace? Well, it's interesting. Um, it, if, if you ever think even for a moment that we're not training the mind already, um, then you're overlooking our habitual tendencies. Um, uh, next week, I'm actually publishing my first gratitude journal, um, which is a way to actually put this into action. And, and by that, I mean, if you wake up every morning and you're thinking, oh, I didn't get enough sleep. I'm not rich enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not successful enough, I'm not healthy enough or whatnot, then you're starting every day with this idea of not enough and and from a place of lack and deficiency. So you're training your mind to always, you're, you're already there, you're starting your day at the bottom every day, <laughs> you know, and you're just like, and with a gratitude journal and what it does is it invites you to every morning, first thing, write down, okay, what am I grateful for? Um, And, you know, it asks you just five questions a day that that train you to start looking at how you're living in abundance, how much there is in your life instead of focusing on what's missing. Mm -hmm. And and that's a way to train the mind to it's not about looking at the glass as half full as opposed to half empty. Mm -hmm. It's about being grateful to have a glass in the first place. That's. That's actually the the invitation behind the gratitude journal, behind Buddhist boot camp, behind faithfully. It's it's really 
it's about shifting the perspective. So the mind, you know, it's like with meditation, people say, oh, I'm trying to control my thoughts. It's like, no, no, I'm, I'm just making sure my thoughts don't control me. Mm-hmm. So the idea of training the mind is to take a step back and kind of observe this internal dialogue and say, I have a choice. I can choose to be happy and I can choose to be grateful for what's there instead of complain about what isn't. So, you know, this idea of training the mind, we are training it. If you complain every single moment of the day, you've trained your mind to focus on the negative. Right. So I'm not suggesting brainwashing. I'm suggesting shifting and training it to work for your evolution. Uh, and and that's something we can all do. And seriously, that I, I, it surprises me. It took me so long to come up with a gratitude journal because in Buddhist bootcamp, I talk about, hey, keep a gratitude journal. It never occurred to me like, hey, Timber, <laughs> make one. So <laughs> so quite literally, I'm in the process of stuffing envelopes. I've got like 500 of them here uh, to mm-hmm. send to people um, and let them know. It's called Mahalo, um, which is which means thank you in Hawaiian. Nice. Um, and it's, it's specifically for 2018 and it guides you every morning, takes five minutes. Like, how do you feel right now? In two words, don't overthink it. Just give me two adjectives and like, what are you grateful for? So that's the idea of, of training, training the mind. I personally have found so much power in, in taking upon a, uh, a gratitude practice myself. And see, here's, here's kind of, um, where, where I see, a lot of people having trouble is they know that they have so much to be grateful for, right? We, we, we live, so many of us live these, these lives of abundance. We've been surrounded with everything and anything we can possibly imagine and desire for, for such a long time. I mean, I grew up that way. Um, I came from a wealthy family. I, whatever I wanted, it was at my fingertips. Um, and everyone that I grew up with was the same. Um, so, it's not it's not a matter of not knowing that we have something to be grateful for right i think everyone has that understanding inside of them that that there's so much to be grateful for so what is it exactly that's getting in the way of people feeling or expressing that gratitude it's that veil of doom <laughs> it's you know it what you focus on is what you see so you can you know, you can be on vacation in Hawaii, and if you have the habitual tendency to complain, then you're going to be like, oh, the sand is too sandy, and the ocean is too blue, and, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, you're going to find something to complain about because that's your habitual tendency. All we are is creatures of habit. Right. So, yes, even if you grew up with abundance, if you didn't take a time out to go, my gosh, I'm so grateful for this bed. I'm so grateful for this roof over my head. I'm so grateful that I have functioning lungs and all of this stuff. If instead, if what you're focusing on is uh, I have to go to work today or I have to do this and the, your your mental voice is I have to instead of I get to um, it's it's very detrimental. So it doesn't matter how much you have. And that's why sure. the idea of possessing more and having more money, which people tell us is the key to happiness is clearly not because you look at people who have so much in the material sense and they're miserable. And for one reason, we haven't defined what enough looks like. Hmm. And if you and if you don't draw a line of, okay, this is enough, this is enough money, this is enough food, this is enough exercise, this is enough whatever, um, then you'll never have it because you it's not defined. But right. once you know, well, this is enough, then you're like, oh my gosh, I have enough. And the moment you have more than that, you're like, oh my gosh, I have more than enough. I want to give. And so you're living in abundance and generosity rather than accumulation and lack and deficiency. And it's just, so that's the benefit of gratitude journal. It goes, it's not about knowing intellectually, you know, it, it's just like, it, it, it's it's about tapping into the feeling because we tend to act on our feelings and if we feel like we are lacking it's going to affect every single aspect of our lives but if we tap into feeling grateful from the moment we wake up oh my gosh it's going to affect every single thing we do throughout the day Mm -hmm. we're it's we're going to celebrate whether the glass is half full or has a drop in it or or not and 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 sometimes just life itself, not even for ourselves, but maybe I was, maybe I woke up this morning 
not for my own benefit, but that, so I can be of service to others. It's this incredible shift in perspective. That's, it's, it's not about knowing. If, if knowing alone uh, made us wise, then every old person would be a wise yeah. Zen master. Yeah. Knowing is not even, there's a chapter I think in Buddhist boot camp, isn't there? It's called, yeah, um, you mentioned that, yeah. N- knowing is not even half the battle, you know? So yeah. it's about going a step beyond knowing. Yeah. So there's so much power in everything that you just said. I have to I have to do a little <laughs> bit of a summary there. I think uh, the first thing that stood out was that knowing and feeling is completely two different things. And that's why you need to train the mind, because if you're focusing on the the things that, that matter and the things that, that make you feel good, then over time, it's going to empower you, right? Empower you. Yeah. That's going to be your, your motivation, your force. It's 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 that story of the two dogs that go into uh, a room separately and one dog comes out and he's wagging his tail and he's really happy and another dog comes out growling and angry. Yeah. You know you know what was in the room is it, it was a room of mirrors. So the dog that goes in angry sees another angry dog gets angry. Yeah, the dog that goes in and he's joyous then he comes out and so we, the the world outside is what it is we bring our perspective to it. And so you and I can both look at the same world at the same situation and have two very different perspectives. One is it's a wonderful, beautiful world with incredible stuff happening. Mm-hmm. And one is, oh my God, we're doomed. <laughs> and, and it's not that one is right and one is wrong. They're, they're both happening simultaneously. It's can we zoom out enough to see the whole picture instead of zooming in on just what's good or just what's bad and realize that it's neither good nor bad. It's just is and 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 it's kind of wonderful in that way. And I don't know, this idea of dropping the labels of good, bad, right, wrong, it, it, me, you, us, them, like dropping all of that and just living in a world of we instead of me is just so uplifting. And it sounds really cheesy and corny. And, and that's why I'm like, yet. just right? pull it, it perhaps, you know, I think that if someone approached me with it before I was ready, I would have brushed them off like they're crazy. But that's why I said it's an invitation. Try it out. You know, just just try out, you know, filling out a, a month of the gratitude journal and tell me you don't feel better at the end of the month. No. Tell me your, your your perspective. It has not shifted from, you know, one of the things we often say that identify ourselves as victims is I have to. Like, oh, I have to go to work. I have to do that. I'm like, you don't have to. You choose to. Celebrate that choice. You go to work because you want to, because of what it affords you. And and it, it's, well, that's not true. I have to pay the mortgage. You don't have to pay the mortgage. You choose to pay a mortgage on that big house. Those are your choices. Yeah. Celebrate them, you know? And yeah, yeah. I I literally write the, the, the check for the electric bill every month with a smile on my face because how blessed am I that I can just flip a switch and there's light, you know, yeah. that's it's pretty incredible. You chose to have that electricity, right? I, yeah, yeah there's, I there's could so choose much not power to. in there. Yeah. And knowing, and you mentioned it already, that knowing that, that the control is within your hands is so empowering. So yeah. that brings me to uh, to another part of the the whole process of training your mind that I want to touch on, and that's what you refer to as making sit happen. So taking <laughs> taking time to slow down to meditate. So I want to ask you uh, because I know that that many of our listeners is either one unfamiliar with with meditation and the benefits of it either in that place or in the place where they they kind of know what, what what it's about but they don't necessarily truly understand how much how much uh power lies in it and how transformative it can can actually be so let me hear your uh your elevator pitch for meditation <laughs> well a lot of people tell me uh, you know oh I, i've tried meditating i, I can't I, i'm doing it wrong or it's it's too hard or whatever it is and and the only reason they say that is because someone at some point told them there's a right way to do it and that's kind of problematic is that we are saturated, um, oversaturated with all of these guides of you have to sit a certain way and your eyes have to be pointing a certain way and your hands have to be in a certain mudra. And it's just unbelievable. And your tongue has to be in the, the roof of your mouth and you got to breathe through one nostril and out the other and, and count to 10 and then start. And you're just like, forget it. I can't do it. That's too much going on, you know, and and. And the idea of meditation is just <laughs> it's it's to take that break and kind of not try to control your thoughts, but first and foremost, just observe them instead of 
identifying with either the angel on one shoulder or the devil on the other, realize that you're – take a step back and realize that you're watching the show happening. To not identify with either one of them, to realize that who you are is the one observing this movie <laughs> and not get so attached to either one. So at first, it's it's to familiarize yourself with the way the mind works before you try to control it. It's like you got to understand how a vehicle works before you drive it. So – you just kind of go, okay, well, this is how I go. This is how I stop. This is this is interesting, and I'm the one in control. I choose how fast to go. I choose when to pull over because quite often we try to quiet the mind, and we can't. You know, We try to go to sleep at night, but our mind is racing, or we try to focus on one thing, but our mind focuses on something else, and it's just – it's kind of ridiculous because we've never trained our mind to stay focused. And meditation is exactly that. It's it's you taking a time out and saying, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to just sit here, for example, and I'm not going to try to control my mind at all. I'm just going to control my body. I'm just not going to physically move no matter what until the little bell goes off and says 10 minutes are up. The benefits of that are not those 10 minutes and, you know, patting yourself on the back like, "Ooh, I went 10 minutes without moving. In fact, it'll be really hard the first few times to not move. It sounds really simple, but your mind is you're trying to tell it what to do and it's going to go crazy. It's going to retaliate. It's going to tell you, oh, but there's a there's a spider crawling on your head and you're going to reach out to scratch and go do it. It got me, you know. Because there isn't a spider, there isn't a fly, there, your, your foot may be going asleep, but that's fine, just let it. The benefit of that is not those 10 minutes, it's later in the day when something happens, someone says something, you see something online, instead of reacting, you're like, wait a minute, I have practice of just sitting with what's going on without reacting to it. And that benefit you know, increases throughout the day because all mindfulness is, is introducing a gap between impulse and action. We are very reactionary. Mm -hmm. So the invitation is to increase that gap between impulse and action. So when you're sitting and you have the impulse to think about something, just bring it back to whatever you want to think about. Or if your meditation is jogging, jog or, or paint or gardening or whatever meditation is when your mind is focused on one thing and one thing only and it doesn't start wandering off to what you're going to have for dinner later mm -hmm. it's it we've we all have our something whatever it may be when while we're doing it we're not we're not thinking about anything else we're totally focused and that's something we really want to tap into so if running or jogging is your meditation swimming gardening art that's that's your thing. Do it. Um, if you just want to try to sit, you can sit there. And that's why, and hence, the sit happens. Um, we we got to make sit happen. We got to take a time out and say, for the next 10 minutes, 20 minutes, however long, I'm just going to sit here and not be so easily manipulated by outside forces. I'm going to take control. And that is really beneficial throughout the day later on. So it's just, again, it's a matter of practice. That's all. Yeah training it's it, uh, it really is just training and it again comes back to to seems like what, what's been the theme of this conversation just retaking control over mm -hmm. over your mind and over your reactions so just uh, again to, to summarize there through the practice of meditation we we're, we're training our ability to to choose how we respond to things choose where we direct our attention and in in the power of choosing we can and ultimately pick the things that that make us feel good right and precisely you, you're a quick learner <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate that um but i will say i've been i've been trying to learn these things for the last maybe five years myself yeah um, it's fantastic yeah so i think uh, I, there's there's a lot of power in, in the things that we discussed timber and again um i think a lot of our listeners are definitely in that in that phase where they're now taking their first steps into uh, to understanding some of these things that we talked about, meditation being being one of them. And I think you definitely did a really good job of just kind of priming them for, for understanding what the practice is all about because as, as I'm sure you would agree, there's a lot of mis misconception around it. Yeah. 
All right, Timber, I think that brings us into the last phase of our interview, the ascending round. So what I have here is a series of questions for you, some of them fun, some of them for tidbits of wisdom, and some for practical advice. Are you ready for them? Shoot, go for it. All right, the first one is a book that you think everyone should read at least once in their life. The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Awesome. It's funny because that book is sitting on the uh, on the side of my bed. My girlfriend's actually in the middle of reading it, so I guess I'll have to give it a go right after she does. Yeah. Next, I got um, – oh, this is going to be an interesting one for you. How would you describe your line of work to a child? Uh, how old is this child? <laughs> because – you know, like uh, the, the, the reason I ask is the first book, Buddhist Boot Camp, is now required reading um, at a few high schools. Okay. And no, so, younger than that, um, let's say, let's say like 10. My line of work. What do you do? A 10 year old kid walks up to you and says, what, what, what do you do for work? What, what do you tell them? Well, technically, I'm a publisher, so I would say I publish other authors, but. Um, but they don't understand what publishing means. What do I do? It's here's your chance to to give this kid a message. I gosh, it, it's I don't think of it as work. It's it's a it's actually a tougher question. I, I would say I don't work. I live. I love that. I I yeah. think that's the best answer you could have given. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Next question. Um, what is one mission or goal that you, you have for yourself that you've yet to achieve? Oh, gosh. I, I don't have a bucket list. Um, Are, would you say you're, you're, you're the type not, not to, to paint that, that future in your mind? Or, or, or is this something that you, you, you do, you come back to, or you reflect about? Well, I think it's it's dangerous to have um I, I have to be very mindful of how i phrase this because it's not dangerous to have goals it's dangerous to be attached to outcomes mm -hmm. so my aspiration my vow my commitment is to spread the message that has enriched my life to as many people as possible and so that goal is is daily um, it's not like something I wish to achieve five years from now or mm -hmm. in 20 years when, mm -hmm. you know, X number of books sell, then I would have reached that goal. Like I, I'm it's so irrelevant to me mm -hmm. if every single day on the journey I am committed to sharing the message. And if even if it enriches just the life of one person, then I've met that goal. It doesn't mean that I don't try to meet it again the next day. So. Mm -hmm. I forget where your original question was, but it was very future based. And yep. I don't I can't plan for an unseen, uncertain future. I don't have that. I have today. What can I do right now mm -hmm. um, is live in line with my values so that I don't yeah, I think it was something related to a bucket list or something I wish to I achieve. What was, yeah. One goal you, you wanted to achieve. Gosh, I, I, I honestly don't have any. Um, that's, it's to, that's fair. I, to do, because, yeah, yeah. I I see. I definitely see where your line of thinking is, and it makes sense. It it, it aligns with uh, with not having a, a list of goals that you have uh, planned to achieve. Um, yeah. It reminds me of of a very um, powerful idea that I once came by, and it's that we don't have time. We we have intentions. Mm -hmm. So rather than thinking in terms of well, I have probably maybe in the 20 years to live, and in this 20 years, I I want to achieve this. It seems like you're you're thinking more in terms of, well, my intention is to to spread as much love, light, joy yeah. into the world, and I will I'll continue to do that with with whatever time. With every breath I've got, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, I like it's, it. I like it. It's the problem. One of the things I talk to with the high school students is. You know, what is it going to take for you to be happy? And the, the problem with their answer is quite often they give me a list, you know, and what they do is they take happiness and they throw it into the future. Like, mm -hmm. I won't be happy until I achieve these things that answer your question. And I think that's kind of the problem. I'm sorry to point that out, is that we are surrounded by questions like, where do you see yourself five years from now? We are we are society just pushes us to look into the future instead of the present moment. And as a result, we feel like we're 
not there yet. Mm -hmm. So the kids mm -hmm. tell me I won't be happy until I graduate from high school, until I go to college, until I get a job, until I make six figures, until I get married, until I buy the house, until I get the Tesla, then I'll be happy. And it breaks my heart because they're taking happiness and it's like holding a football and yet they're throwing it way into the future. Like I won't be happy until dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. And and I just shake my head. I'm like, you can be happy right here and now with what yeah. you've got. And yeah. do you know anyone with the house and the and the, the kids and the, the the Tesla? And they go, yeah. I'm like, are they happy? And they go, no. I'm like, <laughs> then why are you following a recipe that doesn't actually go where you think it will? So, so no, it's it's. It's very present moment based, not future based. Sorry for uh, the it was supposed to be a, no. a quick fire answer and I gave you an entire spiel, but I think there is so much more value in, in how, how we're hearing you answer these questions. And just so you know, when uh, when I had that question on the list, on the plan, it, the, the intention behind it was I want to hear hear how you think about the future, because as we know, Zen and, and Buddhist teachings is a lot to do with with being in the, the present, present moment yeah finding finding joy in the present moment so it's such an interesting uh question when when we come to we, we talk so much about the present how are we supposed to think about the future if we were supposed to think of it at all so i uh i definitely had that in the back of my mind when when i had planned when you wrote it that question. okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> so last question for the day timber and this is probably uh, one of my favorites if not my favorite so i'm gonna hand you a microphone here and this is a, a very special microphone because everything and anything you say through it is going to be heard by the entire world. What do you say through the microphone? Be grateful. That's it. That's it. There's, that's it. That's, that's all we need to know. Um, I think everything else is... Uh, extrapolation on that one concept but I think if we can just be grateful we will enrich our own lives and the lives of others and if we can just do that that I mean that's why there's there was not even a hesitation when you asked that I was like oh shoot what is he gonna say everything I say through the microphone is gonna sound like I'm on helium uh, is it gonna sound like I'm singing it is it gonna and you're like no the whole world's gonna hear it and if I had um, one opportunity it reminds me of a Bjork song um, where she says, I want to go on a mountaintop with a radio and good batteries and play a joyous tune to free the world of suffering. So it's like if we have a platform through which to spread any message, may it be to be grateful um, because through gratitude, we, we tap into happiness, into joy, into non-judgment. Everything ties back into gratitude that's why my ted talk is all about gratitude my book is all about gratitude uh the gratitude journal guess what <laughs> it's all about gratitude so mm -hmm. yes be grateful i think that's the perfect way to to end things off i just want to uh bring a quote i heard you say and it, it ties back to well it is about gratitude and it's gratitude has a way of turning what we have into enough yes and that is the true definition of being rich absolutely Thank you Kemper, so much. Thank you so much for your time. I, I had a really great time discussing uh, everything that you, you had to share with you, share with us, sorry. Last thing is where can we find you and your work if, uh, if we want to find out a little bit more? Oh, uh, BuddhistBootCamp.com. Um, there's links there to Facebook. There's also a Buddhist Bootcamp podcast. Uh, there's the books. The only the only thing I ask of people who get the books and read them is to, don't keep them. Uh, when you're done reading the book, pass it on. Give it to someone else. Keep sharing it with others. My my vision is that for every book that is ordered, at least four people read it. And I know my publisher hates it when I say it. They're like, no, Timber, have them buy five books. I'm like, no, just it's t that's so not like again. It's it's. If you're on the mountaintop and you can just share one message, can can one person enrich the lives of four? Imagine if each one of us did that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, BuddhistBootCamp.com. Um, it has links to the videos. There's a YouTube channel. Um, everything is through there. So go there. <laughs> Timber, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. 
Ascenders. That's my interview with Timber Hawkeye. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that some of the messages and ideas we had to share were ones that resonated with you like they did with me. I'd love to hear that some of you go out and grab a copy of Timber's gratitude journal. I'm sure after hearing him speak to the topic of gratitude, you can start to see or see even more that practicing cultivating gratitude can be so powerful and so beneficial. I know that my conversation with Timber has had a positive impact on my own perception. I mean, gratitude has been something that I value and I've even had a gratitude practice in the past but I hadn't been consistent with it lately until I spoke to Timber. So since speaking to him, I've been a lot more consistent with taking that time out of the day to acknowledge all that that there is to be grateful for. And when I am doing that consistently, I notice a huge carryover to that sense of gratitude um, being carried over to, to my daily life and my daily activities and really truly is provides you with that that feeling of everything being great the way they are and everything that we have is already enough so definitely recommend that you guys start a gratitude practice of your own and that's exactly why i wrote this guide the how to start a gratitude practice guide that i have created and put on the the website for you guys for free um it'll give you a little bit of a sense of my approach to the gratitude practice and i'll give you a little bit of a uh, a place to begin if, if this is something that you're ready to get started with so if you want to check out the how to start a gratitude practice guide you can find that at www.togetherweascend.com forward slash gratitude practice i hope you guys check it out so the how to start a gratitude practice guide Timber's gratitude journal and any other resources that we mentioned in the episode will be found at the show notes to the episode and the URL to that is www.togetherweascend.com forward slash awaken8. So guys, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Until next time.